we're recording. Let's minimize that. Alrighty. Okay, so let's make sure we're all crystal clear on the schedule for the next week. Because uh, we know what's going on the week after. We're all not here. Monday is today. Today, um, we're going to finish our discussion of influence lines. My main goal with the discussion of influence lines is that you understand how to construct an influence line and how to use one. And hopefully, after the last homework assignment, you understand both. Is that a, a fair assessment, hopefully? Today, we're going to continue the discussion of using influence lines because what I want to do is introduce, or introduce a dose of reality. And I want to talk about how we use influence lines in the real world um, by looking at AASHTO, AASHTO Live Load Models for Bridges. Um, I'm going to assign a homework today, but given that you have a project due on Friday um, at, uh, and that I am such a nice guy, instead of making that homework assignment due Wednesday, I am going to make it due Monday, November 29th, when you return. So if you want to do it this week, you can, or you can wait, okay? I don't care. Um, so I do I, go away. Do I think that you should go ahead and knock it out now? Yes, but I'm not going to make you, okay? It is no longer of a homework assignment than any of the others. And if you understand what we're doing today, it's pretty much the same thing, just a different span and a different point. You'll understand what that means here in a little bit. Okay, that's today. Wednesday, we are going to come in, and the only thing we're going to do is troubleshooting and Q&A for the project, okay? I'm actually not recording the lecture on Wednesday because I don't, I'm not lecturing, okay? I figured the whole point of Wednesday's uh, uh, meeting is that you all are going to have your laptops and your, you know, trusses out, and we'll just, I'll just bounce around and answer any questions that you have about the project. So I'm also not taking attendance. So if you're good, and you think you can do the project on your own, you don't need my help, don't come. That's fine. I'm not, not going to hurt my feelings, okay? So I will make myself available on Wednesday just for that project, just for that um, uh, uh, reason. Everybody okay with that? Friday, no class. Friday, the project is due. You submit it online. I think I've already had a couple of you already submit it, like you've already uploaded everything, which is totally fine. Yes, yes. What is, what is this? What is this? So you've had the project on the docket for like two months, but it's that, <laughs> but it's that, that like last 20 minutes. Oh, Son of a gun. I forgot. Like, so like, so like 20 minutes before it's due, you're like, it was supposed to be a truss, not a beam. Dang it. <laughs> My AutoCAD drawing just had a line. It was a W12 by 800. Dang it. It worked. It'll work, trust me. <laughs> no, 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 it, it actually shouldn't. Okay. My goodness. All right, all right. Any questions? And, and here's the thing, the longer I, I extend that due date, the longer I'm dragging out ex excursions with hunting licenses and whatnot, am I right? So, <laughs> you hunt in the morning. So in the middle of the day is when you... Well, here's the thing. If you get the project done before Friday, it's a novel concept, I know. I just want to say, season's been in for a while already, so I'm still, I'm still trying to get that sucker to keep getting wet. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, <laughs> uh, in terms of where we're at on homework, homeworks uh, 7 and 8.1 have been graded. I checked yesterday, 8.2 and 8.3 are we're still working on, and 8.4 was due today. So I'm hoping that this week we can knock out these remaining assignments so that coming into dead week, the only thing that's outstanding, because I'm hoping to grade the project over break, is that the only thing that's outstanding after break is homework 8.5, 9.1, and 9.2. Those are the two homework assignments I'm giving you during dead week, and the final. I'm also going to upload, if you had me for statics last fall, you remember I uploaded a spreadsheet that I called the at-home game to teams. I'm going to do the same thing in here where you'll be able to back calculate what you need to get on the final to get an A or a B or whatever because I know everybody asks. So 
figure I'll make it easier for you. Uh, and that's the class. Any questions? All right. I'm going to be real brief on the recall slides because, you know, I usually like to um, begin the topic with, okay, everybody, let's remember what we're talking about. I think it's pretty clear we're talking about influence lines. You know that to draw an influence line, um, you remove from the structure the ability to resist the re uh, response at the point of interest and then move that structure through a unit displacement, whatever the structure looks like at the end. That's the influence line. Um, we're not going to have to worry about this today, nor are we going to have to worry about how to construct influence lines for reactions or how to construct influence lines for internal shears and moments because the example that we're going to do today, I'm giving you the influence line because it's a very simple influence line. In fact, it looks just like this. Um, I've given you a simply supported beam, and we're going to determine internal shears and moments at a particular point. Um, but what I want to talk about are the loads themselves. One of the things that, that I think that is a common, I don't want to say failing uh, of structural analysis courses, is you're given some problem. Here's the beam, and here's some loads. Do the analysis. Okay? And to, to some degree, there, there is some truth in that process for structural engineers. For example, if you're designing a building, right, the structure can tend to be defined by you, but also defined by the architect and the developer. I mean, if I'm designing this classroom, I kind of know that the beams need to go from here to here, you know, so on and so forth, so I know how long they are. Um, but the loads themselves, where they come from, you know, why did that beam have three kips per foot? Why wasn't it two kips per foot? Why was it 20 kips in concentrated loads? Where did all that come from? Okay. Well, hopefully I answer that at least for bridges a little bit today. And we're going to talk a little bit about that next week uh, as we close out the semester because I want you to, if there's anything that the remaining three lectures are kind of focused on, it's real life. Okay. And that's what I kind of want to close the class on is how we apply this stuff in the real world. Okay. That's, that's what my focus is for the end. Now, if we're talking about bridges, which is sort of the main application driver for influence lines, then um, we, we need to talk about the live loads on bridges. Now, last time we differentiated the difference between the dead load on a structure and the live load on a structure. Remember, dead loads are permanent loads that sit still, that don't move, and so a common dead load is a structure's self-weight. Right? And that should be pretty easy to understand. Right? I have a steel beam. The material steel weighs 490 pounds per cubic foot. You can determine the area and figure out how heavy the beam is. That's just basic, you know, arithmetic. It's not that difficult. Live loads are a little different, okay? Um, and the same thing would apply for concrete beams, et cetera. Live loads are a little different. Of course, we need to account for the live loads on the bridge. Now, live loads are transient loads, loads that move. Obviously, we're talking about the vehicles, right? We're talking about the vehicular traffic on a bridge. Obviously, we need to account for that when we design a bridge, but the cars don't really produce any appreciable load demand on their own. We're not designing bridges for Honda Civics. Okay? Um, what we're designing bridges for are the truck effects, the truck traffic. And sp specifically, the term that I'd like to use are what are called exclusion vehicles. So exclusion vehicles are those singular load uh, components that cause really heavy impact on bridges. Things like concrete mixers, short haul vehicles, uh, et cetera. Um, now, we as engineers need a representation of those loads for the purposes of design. Okay? I'm not going to design a bridge for every conceivable load uh, event that exists. I, I can't do that. I couldn't begin to even start. So instead, what I need to do is I need to do two things. The first is I need to develop a load model that, as best as possible, simulates the effects of that extreme loading that, that highway bridges uh, uh, experience. And we have that load model, and I'm going to talk about that here in a bit. It's called the HL93. Um, the next thing that we need to do is we need to apply some sort of factor of safety. Now, this is going to be a very um, involved discussion in steel design next semester where how we deal with 
uncertainty and factors of safety. Because even if I, uh, even if I uh, uh, utilize this load model, there's still some degree of uncertainty associated with it. And the way that we do that uh, in structures is we have different safety factors, if you will, that we apply to the loads and different safety factors that we apply to, to the resistances. In fact, the philosophy that we utilize is called load and resistance factor design, or LRFD. And so even as structural engineers, once we do this analysis, we tend to take this analysis and bump it up by some load factor. That's going to be a discussion for, for, uh, for next semester, but the, the long or the overall point I want you thinking in the back of your head is that even with this load model that I'm going to present to you, we do still have factors of safety uh, built into the specs, which we'll talk about next semester. Now let me talk about the live load model that we utilize for, um, for bridges. The live load model is called the HL93, and it consists of three components. Okay? It consists of a truck, a tandem, and a lane. Okay? I'm actually going to describe them from the bottom up. Okay? So the design lane is a distributed load. That sort of simulates the, the constant stream of traffic, like just the cars, if you will, uh, on the bridge. And it is equal to 640 pounds per foot. Okay? Um, the tandem is one of two vehicles that you apply. The tandem uh, looks like this. It's two 25 kip axles that are spaced four feet apart. So imagine like a really heavy trailer or a really heavy uh, concentrated load um, and, you know, that, that you would see uh, uh, hauled by some uh, exclusionary vehicle. The vehicle that we utilize is this design truck here. So the design truck consists of three axles. So you can think of like three point loads, a series of point loads. The front axle weighs eight kips, so you can think of like each wheel weighing four kips, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, but we're only going to treat it in terms of axles. So the front axle weighs eight kips, and the two rear axles weigh 32 kips. Okay. Now this front spacing for the um, for the uh, between the front two axles is kept affixed at 14 feet. But this rear spacing is kept between 14 feet, or it varies between 14 feet and 30 feet. Now, for the design truck, it's actually the engineer's responsibility to vary that spacing in order to produce the worst effects. However, 999 times out of 1,000, I'm, I'm just curious, what do you think? What do you think is the worst case scenario, if this is 30 feet or if this is 14 feet? 14. 14. That's 100% right, because if you have a bridge and you want to generate the worst case effects, it sort of makes sense to lump all those loads together than it does to spread them apart. Does that make sense? Now, just so you are aware, this truck is sometimes, the truck by itself has sometimes a different name. It's sometimes called the HS20 or the HS2044. The reason why is these front two axles, how much do these front two axles weigh? 40 kips. So the front two wheels weigh 20 kips. Is that a fair statement? So the HS20, the 20 means that the front two axles weigh 20 kips, and the 44 means that it was developed in 1944. See, this load model's actually been around for quite some time, uh, and it used to be back in the day, what you would do is you would basically, and I'm, I'm going to get very simple because I'm not going to account for riders or other components in the, in the specification, but it used to be that you would basically account for either the truck or the lane, whichever gave you the worst case response. But now what you do in the spec is you actually account for both of them together. The idea is that between the 1940s and now, the loads on highway bridges have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. So now we combine both of them. So the way that you combine them in the spec is you say it's the worst case scenario of either the truck plus the lane or the tandem plus the lane. And I am sk admittedly skipping some details because there's a whole bridge engineering aspect to this discussion that I'm not talking about when it comes to impact factors or live load distribution or et cetera. But that's really outside the scope of what we're trying to do in here. What we're trying to do in here is just understand the fundamentals of the structural analysis component. The other thing I, I, I want to mention about this is that the HS2044 truck, I want to be crystal clear, it does not exist. You cannot go to Adams Trucking and, and ask them, you know, hey, can I see your HS244? It doesn't, it's not a real truck, okay? This is a mathematical model that represents, and, and again, I'm skipping some details here, but it sort of represents like the statistically possible upper bound loads that you would see on highway bridges in the United States, okay? 
that by applying this load, combined with the, the factors of safety present in the spec, that uh, you're, you're going to represent the highway traffic that you need to design for. <coughs> Does this make sense? So to give you an example, you know, this is the Ashto spec uh, loading that, uh, that you see you know, present that every bridge in the United States needs to be designed for. You will find states that utilize somewhat different vehicular loads for different vehicular regions. For example, there are some uh, uh, roads in West Virginia that are designated as CRTS routes, Coal Resource Transportation System routes. And on those uh, uh, roads, the loads are a little heavier, right? Because they have a, a much higher frequency of heavier load on that bridge. But it makes sense to design those bridges for those loads, right? Does that make sense? So Kentucky has some different provisions. Every state has their own unique sort of twists on how they do things. But this is the minimum standard that every state must need to uh, adhere to. And I want to show you how to apply this load model to a given bridge. And I guarantee you, if you understand what we're doing today, the differences in the, the, or, or the stuff that I'm not talking about, the stuff in the specs or the safety factors, are really just lookups. I just take this and, I don't know, multiply it by 1.75. It's really, really easy stuff. This is the hard stuff. If you understand this, I guarantee you the, the simple, or the, 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 the stuff that I'm skipping on the bridge engineering side or the design side is very, very simple. So what I want to do is I want to look at an 80-foot long beam, and I want to determine the internal shears and moments at this point this point being 30 foot from the support, okay? Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to determine the internal shears and moments due to the lane load, the internal shears and moments due to the tandem load, the internal shears and moments due to the truck load. And we're going to develop an envelope of responses. And we're going to do this at a particular point. What software programs will do is do this for a whole bunch of points. And the idea that, is that that is close enough to represent the full envelope of uh, responses excuse me, on the bridge. Let's pull out our handy dandy notebook. Or I'll go back to this here in a bit. Where did my mouse go? My mouse didn't like me today. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to do a series of analyses. We're actually going to have quite a few results at the end of this problem. So this problem is going to have like 12 different answers. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll maybe categorize these answers like this. So we'll say component, and so we'll have the lane, the tandem, and the truck. And then we're going to have like a series of different answers. So we'll say the maximum positive shear and the maximum negative shear and the maximum positive moment and the maximum negative moments. This is going to be in kips, kips. This is going to be in foot kips. Does that make sense? So we'll, we'll add to this as we do the problem, but, and, I'll, and I'll reproduce this on the screen here in a bit. But in order to do this, we're going to handle these loads. And I'm doing them in this order because I want to do the easiest load first. I think the easiest load is the lane load. So in order to handle the lane load, we're going to need areas of these regions here and areas of this region here. So what is the area? Let's start off with this. Can anybody tell me how to compute the area of that triangle? So one half of 50 times 0. 0.625. Does anybody have an answer on that? What's so funny? I didn't say that. I didn't. I must have missed something. This area here. So tell me what. Okay, so that's correct. What about this area? Uh, 
five, negative five. All right, is everybody with me on that? So why did I need these areas? This is the influence line for shear. This is the influence line for moment. How do I determine the, the maximum positive shear from the lane? How do I do that? I'm asking you. How do I do that? After the homework we just did. What's that? No, the lane load is a live load. The lane, the tandem, and the truck are a live load. Let's see if y'all are paying attention. How much is the lane? Or six four kips per foot. How do I how do I do this? If I'm trying to determine the positive lane shear and the the negative lane shear, how, tell me how to do that. And the negative area, yeah. So this is going to be zero point six four times fifteen point six two five. 0 0.64, negative 5.625. But it, am I going too fast or does this make sense? I don't want to get any, like if, if there's something I'm going too fast on, let me know, right? This is the same thing we did on the last homework assignment. If we have a live load, we take the magnitude of that live load times the positive areas to generate the positive response, negative areas to generate the negative response. This is a live load. So it's, you know, we only put it where we need to. So help me out. What are we getting for a value for positive and uh, negative shear? Let me turn that off. That's going to get annoying. Okay, so positive 10. And what about for negative lane? All right, do I have a second on these values? Okay. So that means that this is 10, negative 3.6, okay? Now what about for M lane positive? I'm going to take 0 0.64 times what? What's that area? 750. So, what is that? Four eighty. So four eighty foot kips. Now, what I'm curious about is what's that? What is? I'll say note. I can do better than that. Note, what is M lane negative? Zero. Zero. There is nowhere that I can put the lane load to generate negative bending at that point because everywhere on the influence line, I have positive moment, right? So that means this is zero. And this is zero. Now, before we move on, are there any other conclusions that you think we can make? These are all going to be zero, right? Because there's nowhere that I can place a vertical load to generate negative moment at this point. So they're all zero. Does that make sense? Everybody with me on that? So hopefully that... that follows, okay? Okay. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's see if you can follow along for what's coming next. Now what we're going to do is the tandem. Now if you recall, the tandem is 225 kip axles spaced four feet apart. So what I need to do is I need to move that tandem 
somewhere along the structure to generate worst case responses. And we're going to start with shear. Okay? So with shear, notice how I got kind of lazy and I copied a bunch of these. Let's do this one first. Hold on. Let me let me try something. Oh, that's not going to work. Let's start with this. Let's start with that. Sorry. I made a bunch of copies of these because I'm lazy. I'll tell you what I'm going to need. I'm going to need one of each of these. Man, I made a mess. Okay. So for the tandem, I'm going to need two shears. I'm going to need one moment. Okay. So... I have two 25 kip axles. Let's say I'm trying to generate worst case positive shear. Where does one of the axles need to go? Probably needs to go right there, doesn't it? Right? So one of them needs to go right there. And so where does the other one go? Does it go over here on the left or over here on the right? The right. Four feet over the right. So what I'm doing for positive shear is I'm saying 25, 25, right? So I need this value, and I need that value, where this dimension is 4 feet. Now I'll show you a little trick. What is this dimension right here? Forty six. What is zero point six two five times forty six over fifty? Zero point five seven five. That is that value right there. Because what I'm basically doing is 0.625 is to 50 as something is to 46. So just scale that down. It's just linear interpolation. That's that value right there. So I propose then that V tandem positive is 25 kips times 0 0.625 plus 25 kips times 0 0.575. And what is that? 30. By the way, I, I sort of formulated this example so the numbers would come out kind of pretty in the end. In real life, they don't actually come out all that pretty, but just so we could all see where this stuff's coming from. Does that make sense? So, if that's the case, help me out. Where should I put the truck to generate worst case negative shear? Or sorry, the tandem. If the tandem's here, where should I put the tandem to generate negative shear? Boom, right? So it should be like that, like that. And so that means I need this point right here where that's four feet. So, help me out. How do you think, what's an easy way of determining that point? Twenty-six over what? Over thirty times what? No. There you go. So this is negative zero point three seven five 
times 26 over 30. And what is that? Negative 0 0.325. So that puts that like that. So therefore, V tandem negative is 25 kips times negative 0 0.375 plus 25 kips times 0 0.325. Again, the same tools as we used last time. Concentrated loads times values, distributed loads times areas. It's no different, okay? So what do we got for this? Negative 17.5. Do I have a second on that? So from the tandem, we have a range of either 30 to negative 17.5. Is that a fair statement? That should be fair, right? <clears throat> now, how do we do the moment? Now, this is interesting. So I propose that at a minimum, one of those axles needs to go right here, right? Like one of them's got to. But the question is, do we put the other one right here or do we put the other one right here? Now I'm a betting man. I, I want to see who's a betting man. Do we want to put it on the left or the right? Why? Because it's less of a slope, right? Now, the math should bear that out, right? I want to go ahead and do the math, and there is a reason why. The reason why is because sometimes for the truckload, it isn't that obvious, okay? So bear with me. <clears throat> so we have 18.75. Times 46 over 50 and 18.75 times 26 over 30. What are each of these going to be? So, in other words, I'm trying to figure out what this value and what that value is are on the influence line. So, what's the first one? 46 over 50 times that. So this is 17.25, 17.25, and what about this next one? 16.25. So now, this one bore out what we thought made sense, right? We need the 25 kips like that. Does that make sense? Okay. With me so far? So therefore, the moment tandem or the, the maximum positive moment from the tandem is 25 kips times 17.25 plus 25 kips times 18.75, right? We're taking the two largest ones, right? This one and that one. Those are the two that we're using. Maybe I'll highlight those. That and that. And so what do we get from that? 900. And note, what is M tandem negative going to be? Zero. So this is 900, and that's zero. So let me get rid of this craziness because I got a lot of extra lines here. Let me bring some order to chaos here. 
So now we're going to do the design truck. So we're going to need that, going to need that, and we're going to need, oh, <gasps> I, I deleted one too many. Hold on. What was that? Dun, dun, dun. All right. So now we need to do the design truck. Okay. Now with the design truck, here, here's the thing about the design truck. So the first thing about the design truck is this. So the definition states that we have 8 kips, 32 kips, 32 kips. And this dimension here is 14 feet, and this one is 14 to 30 feet. But as you're going to see here in a little bit, it's going to make sense for every single case that we utilize here in a second to keep that at 14 feet, okay? So I'm going to put a little note here off to the side and say note for all cases take variable axle spacing equal to 14 feet. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Now, let's um, let's do a little bit of figuring here. So, let's do like what we did before. We're going to do positive shears. Okay. So we're going to be putting our truck over here, right? So. I propose what we need is this value and this value. We need to know these values on the influence line where that's 14 feet and 14 feet respectively. So how are we going to do that? Well, what is it? 0 0.625 times something over 50 and 0 0.625 times something over 50, right? What is that something? Like for this one right here, what is that? If this is 50, what's that? 36, right? And if this one's 36, what's the other one? 36 minus 14 is what, 22? So what is that? Um, I think this one's 45. This one's 225. Did I do that right? The second one, I got a .235. Yeah, it is. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. I, I, can't, I can't read. For some reason on my printout, this example came out really small. Okay. So... Would you agree then that we need to have a load here, a load here, and a load here, right? So, now I want everybody to watch up here. So, so does that mean this is 8, 32, and 32? Say it again. Exactly right. This needs to be 32, 32, and 8. See, there's this weird thing about cars. They can drive this way and that way. Uh, it's crazy, I know. But cars can actually go in the opposite direction just like the truck. There's nothing to say that you can't take the vehicle and boom, turn it the other way. So I'm putting the heaviest axle 
over this heaviest load to generate the heaviest shear possible. So instead of 8, 32, and 32, I'm doing 32, 32, and 8. Does that make sense? Why I'm doing that? Okay, so then V truck, so the maximum positive shear I get out of the truck is 32 times 0 0.625 plus 32 times 0 0.45 plus 8 times 0 0.275. Does that make sense? So what what is that when you chug that out? Say it again. 36.6. Do I have a sec second on that? Wait. 36.6? Hold on. Did I, I got 43.2. Did I not? Did I do something wrong here? All right, we'll go with 36.6. I'll claim that one is a mistake on me. It's going on the coin, right? All right, 36.6. Okay. How many am I at now according to the student tally? Okay. So first off, I don't I don't agree with the scaling functions that you're utilizing, but but again, it's a corrupt system because I'm the one who keeps the official tally. We have, we only have two more I better watch out. Seven more or five more well, we're we're canceling a couple of them there, so. You've got me. You figured it out. I don't know. That's an insult. <laughs> we thought he was an idiot this whole time, but you might have a propensity for geotechnical engineering because of the hole digging that you're doing. You know. All right. So. Help me out. So we've got negative 0 0.375. You can kind of see where we're going with this. So we need um, negative 0 0.375 times something over 30. And I think that's 16. And 2 over 30. Did I do that right? I think so. So while we're doing this, this is 30 feet. What if this was 20 feet? What would that mean? No. Exactly. One of the axles is just going to fall off the bridge, and you just disregard it, which happens. That's, a, that's okay. You know. That's why we don't do this analysis for just one point. We do it for tenth points, right? So what are we getting for these? Um, I think this one's like negative 0 0.2. And I think this one, I think I got negative 0 0.025. Okay, so, so what do we have? We have 32, 32, and eight, so now the truck is facing the way it's reported. So what are we getting here? Negative 18.6. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. 
So that means this one right here is negative 18.6. And the only thing that's left is this one. So here's what we're going to do for this last one. So is everybody kind of following along the interpolation that we're doing? So we've got this one. What I'm going to do for this interpolation is I am going to need 14 foot interpolations on either side. Okay? Just give me all of them, and you'll understand why here in a second. So I need this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. Now, if it's okay, I'm going to go ahead and tell them to you. I'm getting, let's see, 13.25. I'm getting 8.25. And I'm getting 10 and 1.25. Is that okay? So help me out. How does the truck need to be placed in order to generate maximum response? What load needs to go right here? Thir thir say it again. The middle load, right? This is 32. This one, 32. And where does the 8 go? It goes here, right? Because that's going to generate the worst case response, right? It depends on where it goes, right? So that's why I said just give it to me on all sides and then we'll see. So it's not necessarily they just all go over here because even though this is at a lower slope, that value all the way over here is smaller than this one. So this needs to be 32. This needs to be 32. That needs to be 8. So And what are we getting as an answer for that? Anybody have an answer for that? That no, that's what I have, eleven oh four. And note M truck is zero. So, 11.04. If you will indulge me for like one minute, I'll show you something. So, this is a design report that I did a while back. Uh, where I was assessing some standard uh, steel bridge design. Uh, steel bridge designs. And... If I go to this eSpan 140 uh, resource, there was a report that I was uh, part author on where we were analyzing some standards. And here's the report. And if you look at some of the analysis that we did later in the report, I'll show you something and then we'll call it. But I want you to kind of see what this looks like in the real world. You do, there, there are some code specific things that you do that I'm not covering in here, but yes. Okay, so this was, oh goodness, that's way too far. So this was some of the, the, uh, the results that we had from some of the analysis that we did for this particular uh, bridge assessment. And so what we're doing is we're cutting the bridge into 10 points. This particular bridge was 60 feet long. And so like, for example, we did our analysis just now 30 feet from the support. So if we did our, our analysis, let's say, 
80 feet or 18, sorry, 18 feet from the support. That would be this row. So like this is the truck positive, truck negative, tandem or lane positive, lane negative, tandem positive, tandem negative. These are moments. And then here are the shears. And it's done in the exact same way, the 100% exact same way. And so what's happening is we just do this, you know, at a series of points along the bridge, and we just continue to do this analysis to get the envelope of results. So for the truck, the lane, and the tandem, we've got an envelope of results, a range of results. But for these right here, these are the dead loads. There's no range. It's just here's the shears, here's the shears, here's the shears. And if you plot that, it's just a shear diagram. So that's all it is. So does that make sense? And so what you would do, as you were saying, is you would take this like it was in Excel, and you would combine this in certain code-specific ways in order to generate your worst-case response, and that's what you design for. So, Make sense? And one final note, and then I am done. I know I'm holding you over a little long. This is what influence lines look like for indeterminate structures. They can be curved. So like this is the influence line for the reaction at A, and it's kind of curved, but that's indeterminate. Don't do that for determinate structures. So, But that's what mass tan and software functions are for. But same patterns apply, like that jump is one, that slope is one, et cetera. Sound good? I'm done. I'm sorry, I kept you over. <laughs>